from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in London, where I have to say it's been a grim week for cricket in this country. We have had MPs listening to harrowing stories of racism and bullying from the former Yorkshire cricketer Azim Rafiq. We discussed uh, at length uh, those issues on the programme last week, but laid bare with parliamentary privilege, Azim could say what he liked. Many of those from Yorkshire whom allegations were levelled against chose not to appear at the hearing, but it was followed across the game and, and by many around the world as well, and can only commend Azim for his bravery in feeling able to speak and now to also fervently hope that what was laid bare in terms of lack of process can be fixed and that more people can feel comfortable about making complaints and, and more so that they will be dealt with and that hopefully people will learn and that fewer complaints will happen going into the future. But it's been a harrowing week and I hope that Stumps now with you guys, Jim and Cherry, is going to cheer me up somewhat. Ali, yes, we need a bit of cheering up. It's Jim Maxwell in Sydney. And uh, the good news here is that Victoria is about to open up and everyone can go out and have a good time. So that means we might get a crowd on Boxing Day at the MCG. Um, that's, that's the good news. That and is good news. Absolutely. <laughs> and Western Australia as we go, but mm, not at the moment. Well, good luck with that. And of course, congratulations, Jim. You have taken the silver wire this time around. Who would have thought? But well played, Australia. This is Charu Sharma in Bangalore for All India Radio, where it just, you know, in Bangalore hasn't stopped raining. Will somebody please take this rain away? It's gotten my brain now. However, of course, luckily it didn't rain in Jaipur. So there's a little bit of retribution there that the Indians earned over New Zealand, a narrow tight match. But uh, good news for the Indians, because obviously they've recovered mentally from their base carring T20 World Cup. Well, let's start this week by looking back at the ICC Men's T20 World Cup, because after 45 matches, 12,162 runs and 526 wickets. And yes, I don't work those numbers out myself. I have people to do that. Uh, <laughs> Australia were crowned champions. India floundered, didn't they? They didn't even get out of the group stages. Uh, for Pakistan, Baba Azam was on fire with the bat. New Zealand once again came close, but not close enough. Didn't quite make it over the line in the final. And the defending champions, West Indies, were demolished by England along the way. But it was Australia who won the competition. And let's be honest, I don't think any of us really saw that coming, did we? And Jim, I know you love it when we do this to you, but just have a listen back to what you said in the week when we discussed it on Stumped after Australia had just been thrashed by England in the group stage. We lost another T20 game. We don't care, really. We're only interested in the Ashes. Uh, the more so as we... we uh, as we flounder in this tournament. <laughs> still still feel the same, Jim? I mean, basically, you could have just flicked a coin, couldn't you, in that final? It could have gone either way in this fickle game of T20. And it doesn't really matter to the Aussies, does it? <laughs> if you got to the semi-finals of this thing, you know, toss a coin. So who's going to bowl first, OK? Put your house on them. Mm. Uh, well, there was something in that. Um, Finch won six of seven tosses. That certainly helped. But Australia played a very powerful clever, well-executed final. They're, the batting of Marsh and Warner as good as you ever want to see in any game of cricket. The execution, Marsh 14 of his first three balls. They're running between the wickets. The way they seized the moment after New Zealand had a bit of a scary start with only 57 from uh, their first 10 overs. And from there, they were going to struggle uh, to make enough for Australia to be worried about chasing with a deep batting order. But um, the interesting thing about this is that 10 years ago, Pat Cummins at 18 was the youngest player in the Australian test team. 10 years on, look at this T20 game and it's supposed to be about youth, isn't it? Well, Pat Cummins is still the youngest player in the T20 side. I mean, they're all ancients in this Australian team. <laughs> so hats off to experience. Forget oh, yes. youth need experience there is something to be said for that granted and cherry what did you you know how did you enjoy the final and the standout performances jim's already mentioned well jim i mean no disrespect but you know the heart was with new zealand uh, and i'm <laughs> you know as the underdogs are generally speaking but yeah i just you know wonder what will it take for new zealand to keep winning these trophies because they're so close and they're so good and they're so uncomplaining they're such a great side and so fit 
everything that you would require in a major international side that should be winning. But yet they're falling just a, a half step short. So, yeah, you know, your, your heart does go out to them. But I, I have to say that they continue to earn glory by being so uncomplaining. So there's something to be said for that because, you know, other teams might go and say this, that, and the other. Well, you know, we had to bat first and, and this went against us and we lost that player, but not New Zealand. They are just, I think, a side that, you know, we, we, there's no choice but to deeply appreciate what they're made of. Their attitude is fabulous. Well, I want to look specifically at some of the individual performances in the T20 World Cup. So Jim and Chari, we thought here on Stumped we would give our own sort of, um, I don't know, sort of virtual or metaphorical, well, yes, T20 awards for, you know, it has been a really enjoyable competition. So got a few categories for you. What about best player of the tournament? I mean, there were obviously leading wicket takers, leading run scorers, a player of the tournament in David Warner as well. So who would your picks be, Jim, if I start with you? Oh, well, I'm, I'm going to have a, a, a bit of a green and gold eye here, but um, uh, the performances of uh, Warner and Zampa in particular. But in crunch games, uh, Josh Hazelwood is really making a point in the last couple of years. Remember, this guy was discarded as a white ball mm. cricketer. Um, and three for 16 in the final. Line and length. Huge difference, particularly when he's made at the other end was none for 60, Mitchell Stark. <laughs> so... Uh, Hazel, Hazelwood's one of my favourite cricketers because of, of what he very quietly, undemonstrably contributes to the team. Well, I've got to say that, you know, normally we talk about Pakistan in terms of being a mercurial team, which side of the bed did they get up from, and so on and so forth. But for them to be held together uh, by, I, I suppose, the leadership first of Baba Razam and his consistency with the bat. He just looked so fluent, so fabulous every time. And that's what made them the favourites later on in the tournament. So for me, it would have to be Babar Azam because of what he brought to Pakistan. And of course, his fabulous batting, which has propelled him to be world number one uh, again, if I'm not wrong. My number one pick is actually the same as yours, Chari. I was going to go for Babar oh. Azam. Oh, for, no, four sure. half centuries, oh. the consistency, the leadership, you know, that's that sparkling opening stand with Rizwan that just lit the tournament. Uh, in the, the game against India. So, yeah, I'm going with Barbara Azam as well. The biggest surprise of the tournament for you, that could be on-field or off-field. Um, I might give you my starter for 10 on this one because when England played the West Indies, the West Indies as the defending champions, albeit going back a few years, but they were rolled over for just 55 that was a shock. That was a surprise. But go on, Jim, Cherry, what were yours? You mentioned the start of the tournament, and, and, and I don't mean to be, you know, India obsessed, but the fact that this mighty Indian team did not take a single Pakistani wicket was just a massive surprise. I mean, the whole country just kind of melted right there, and, and it, it, nobody could get up after that because, I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing to, to lose uh, to Pakistan, which never had in, a, in an ICC uh, World Cup event. And then, of course, you might have lost narrowly, you might have taken a few wickets, but not to take a single wicket was just an enormous slap in the face and a huge surprise. I could have said that one. I thought I'd leave that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jim? Well, it's, it's a package here of surprise and disappointment. I mean, in, in India, a uh, huge surprise about their inordinary performance at the start. Uh, and they didn't recover, really. Uh, by the time they started winning, it was too late. So I don't know whether they were ego blown or, or what in that Indian team, but um, their, their supporters <laughs> must have been asking a lot of questions. The other surprise, sorry, just, just, just quietly, uh, for a, a country that's barely got any cricket at all, uh, Namibia's performance in just playing that World Cup was at just outstanding, just unbelievable. I think you've both preempted almost the, the next one, which is going to be the biggest disappointment. So do I take that as red cherry that it is relating to India? And is that also yours, Jim? Or can we also add in, I suppose, on the flip side of mine as well, the, the disappointment of the defending champions, the West Indies, sort of barely showed up? Uh, the West Indies, as you say, all over 55, they never got going in the tournament. And uh, they got to do a bit of thinking about um, how they're going to how to pl play their cricket. Um, but it's all about momentum, and they just they never got going in that regard. In a more umbrella, umbrella sense, uh, it was rather disappointing to have teams chasing win a lot more comfortably. So, 
you know, it just sort of dampened the possibilities of this T20 World Cup because we know it's close enough anyway. It's like, a, you know, you toss a coin. But by losing the toss and then having to uh, bat first just seemed to be, you know, I, I'm sure the teams were very disappointed at losing the toss. So I, I think that was a, a major collective disappointment, that the fact that it was so overwhelmingly uh, favouring teams that chased. What about a standout moment to end with? Is it the lifting of the trophy? Is it a particular wicket, a six, a catch? Well, I, I'll go first on this. I think it was what Wade did to Shaheen Shah freely. Oof. Just left the whole world shell-shocked, left, left Pakistan shell-shocked because they may have gone on to lose, but the way they lost, uh, and, and there was a team that was fabulous on momentum, but three balls changed the whole game for Pakistan, and it was just three fabulous shots. So that moment you know, still remains in my brain. Can I share that with you as well? Or is that a bit, is that oversharing? <laughs> We're just on the same we'll wavelength. Go, it, yeah. <laughs> go on, Jim, what's yours? Well, that, that's certainly one of them. Uh, but if you want um, just one one moment of the tournament, it was the first ball Marsh faced and he hit Mill into the stand for six. And that was a, you know, if there's a game changer in the momentum of a match, even though Australia was moving along quite well at the time, uh, that was a big one. Because the, the execution of the batting, uh, the shot selection, running between the wickets, that was as, as close to the most perfect partnership you'd see in the crunch in a, a game of cricket. But it was triggered by Marsh hitting the first ball he faced way into the crowd. Um, and, um, yeah, that was the moment, I think. I did enjoy the send-off that was given to Dwayne Bravo um, and, and kind of a send-off to, to Chris Gale. But, you know, a player retiring and, yeah, you, you saw the guard of honour. Those things always you know, do leave me, like, quite a little bit moved, you know, watching players say goodbye and sign off, and particularly someone who's just been on the scene for, uh, for, for so long and so many years. Now, we've discussed the ups and downs of teams at the Men's T20 World Cup and Australia's triumph in particular. But what does it take to be a winner mentally? Well, to answer that question, we are joined by former England international and now sports psychologist Jeremy Snape, who's also host of his own podcast called Minds of Champions. Jeremy, welcome to Stumped. Hi there. It's good to see you. You've worked with several international teams in cricket and in other sports as well. So what does it take to be a winner? Well, that's a massive question. I don't know how long <laughs> the show is, but uh, I'm not sure we've got long enough. It, it's a fascinating subject. And I think uh, having interviewed probably about 100 world-class performers, I think the elite champions have got this ability to visualize success you know what it's going to feel like what it's going to be like what their life's going to be like to be a top champion and that motivates them through the really difficult days the 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 tough times in the gym the recovery after injury you know the falling out with a coach all of those difficult things I think we have this perception that talent is going to be enough you know we get a a talented young leg spinner in or somebody who plays a beautiful cover drive age 13 and we've just got to feed them carrots and they'll end up as the next superstar. But that's just not true. And I think this ability to adapt, you know, we, we see the elite performers that are on the top stage for 10 years. They're probably 10 different players because the world's best performers are analysing their weaknesses and trying to exploit them. They're limiting their strength. So actually, we don't see a static talent or performer. We see somebody who's constantly got to adapt. Um, so that ability to be coachable and keep innovating and learning new skills is definitely part of the DNA of a high performer. And of course, cricket's a team game. So we also need to have that selfless character as well as just that uh, brilliant skill. So, yeah, quite a mix there, but um, special players to get to the top. Jeremy, hi, this is Charu Sharma from Bangalore. Uh, you just mentioned team spirit. And I, I, there's very little doubt that perhaps all teams are equal in spirit, but of course, some just don't go on to win. I mean, we've talked about New Zealand now losing three white ball finals and people start throwing things like mental hurdle about. So is that a reality? And is this something that can be overcome? And, and how, Jeremy, because you're, you're dealing with the, 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 the mental situation of sport, which I still think needs a lot more work. So just on that whole uh, mental hurdle aspect. I always find it interesting that we vilify the runners up more than we do for the rubbish teams that never got there in the first place. It's almost like failing under pressure is a bigger crime than being rubbish, uh, which I always think is interesting. So 
you know, for the size of the talent pool and resources that New Zealand have got, I think it's an incredible success story. You know, they're in the top two of all formats of the game. You know, I think they lost the toss in the 2020 final, uh, an important toss, and got outplayed. They, they didn't they didn't capitulate. They got beaten by an incredible team. And, you know, Marsh played a brilliant inning. So, you know, I think you've got to be very careful about these broad brush comments. And we've got to dissect it a little bit to what actually happened. And if you get into nine finals and there's seven different reasons why you lose it and they are fair reasons, then you're not a choker in my view. So as we look at the Ashes... How different is the the mental pressure for both teams? Or is it something you just go in with your instinct? You don't think about it? Well, I think you'd struggle not to think about it with the amount of media frenzy. You know, we hear the the hundred year sort of repeats, those incredible uh, tear jerking videos of Bodyline and the, you know, 2005 series, those iconic moments. And that's what the Ashes is all about. It's a career defining tour. But again, I think the players shouldn't be thinking about, um, you know, the history and the emotion and the rivalry and the sort of nationalism. They should be thinking about who am I going to be facing? It's almost like they're going to be um, sitting an exam, you know. So as a student listening, they might think, OK, well, I've got a big exam coming up. Have I done my homework? And only those players can tell us whether they feel prepared to answer the questions they're going to be you know, examined pretty uh, ruthlessly on the pitch by the Australians uh, and uh, they've got to have the answers. Great to get your insights, Jeremy. Thank you so much for being with us on Stumped. Looking forward to the series. That's Jeremy Snape, former England international and now sports psychologist. Good stuff. Thanks very much. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Stumped here on All India Radio. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter. We're at BBCWS Sport and use the hashtag BBC Stumped and You can check us out on YouTube as well. Search for BBC World Service and you'll find us there. My thanks to Cherry Sharma and Jim Maxwell and, of course, to all of you for listening. We'll speak to you next week. Bye-bye. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.